Jesus himself, as we noted, pointed to Genesis 1.27 and 2.24 as the prime text in the Old Testament that deal with sexual ethics. His whole foundation for sexual ethics is built on that foundation. And Genesis 1.27 makes clear that there's a close connection between being made male and female and being made in God's image. What that in part means is that what we do sexually can threaten to either enhance or efface the image of God that's stamped in our being. We know that animals, of course, are also made male and female, but animals are not made in the image of God. I had a wonderful dog, Coco, a cockapoo, part cocker spaniel, part poodle, loved Coco, great dog for children, but I never derived my sexual ethics from Coco. Coco is not a very discriminating a creature so far as sexual purity is concerned. I never blame Coco for that because Coco wasn't made in God's image. I am. And to correlate being made in God's image in Genesis 27 with being made male and female is a way of saying that what we do sexually will impact the stamp of God's image on our being. Therefore, don't say it's unimportant or irrelevant to God or the way in which we live our life in relation to God. That's why Paul talks about uh, the body being a temple of the Holy Spirit that's in us and does so in the context of talking about sexual purity issues. And that brings us to Genesis 2:21 to 24, where uh, in this context where we hear that God is in search of somebody who can be an appropriate counterpart or complement to the human being that he has created. And the Hebrew here is the term konegdo, which uses a Hebrew preposition neged, which means both corresponding to and opposite to, which is the perfect choice of terms here because a man and woman correspond to each other as fellow human beings, but are also opposite to one another in terms of their sex or gender. And then we get this wonderful story about the creation of woman from this human. He's called in Hebrew an Adam, which we transliterate often simply as Adam as a proper name, and it becomes eventually a proper name in Genesis. But in its initial use, it simply means a human, a nondescript human, a human that we don't characterize as specifically male or specifically female, simply a being formed from the Adama, the ground, so the Adam. And the image that's portrayed here is something is extracted from this Adam or human. Four times this is emphasized in the short space of Genesis 2:21 to 24. Something is taken from the Adam. Now usually that's translated as a rib, and it might mean rib, but it's interesting that the Hebrew term Salah that's used there, about 35 or so other occurrences in the Old Testament, all the other occurrences in the Old Testament refer to the side of something, once to the side of a hill, and all the rest of the time is the side of a piece of sacral architecture. For example, the side of part of the Ark of the Covenant, or the side of part of the Solomonic Temple, or the Tabernacle, or the side of the Eschatological Temple in Ezekiel. And it's a way of communicating that what has been created from a side of the human is sacred to God. This is sacral architecture. Again, this is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, when he's talking about sexual purity, makes the point that your body is a temple of the spirit of God that's put in you. And it's a way of communicating that even in our sexuality, in our creation as male and female, this is something that's sacred to God. So that we, when we bend it, when we blur it, when we violate it, when we treat the creation of two distinct genders, male and female, created to be complements, counterparts to one another, when we treat this as of no account, in God's view, this is sacrilege. This is a violation of what God has created to be holy and good. So think about a church now that many of the mainline churches, and even sometimes in some evangelical sectors, are now saying, no big deal. Doesn't matter whether we approve or disapprove homosexual practice, as long as those relationships are committed and loving. When in fact, we have communicated to us in the canon of scripture, right from the beginning in the creation text in Genesis 1 and 2, 
confirmed by Jesus in his delineation of what's foundation for sexual ethics, repeated by Paul when Paul singles out offenses that he thinks parallel, for example, the offense of idolatry in terms of suppressing the truth about who God is and the way God has made us. In each case, we find these are not regarded as matters of indifference within the text, things that don't matter. On the contrary, they're regarded as foundational for sexual ethics because right from the beginning of Genesis, it's understood that foundational for all sexual ethics is the creation of man and woman, male and female, as sexual complements to each other, who when they unite, restore the one flesh union out of which they emerged. When we talk about the Levitical prohibitions, we have to set them within a larger historical and literary context. And an important point about that is that these are not the only texts in the Old Testament that would have relevance for the issue of homosexual practice. We could talk about the creation text, but beyond those, every, every text in the Old Testament that has anything to do with sexual ethics, whether that's a narrative, legal material, proverbs, poetry, metaphors, always presupposes a male-female requirement, no exceptions. So the Levitical prohibitions simply make explicit what is implicit everywhere. And these prohibitions we know are absolute in their framing in terms of man-male intercourse. A man shall not lie with a male as though lying with a woman. Uh, it is an abomination. That is something abhorrent or detestable to God. Now, there are other sexual practices where this is located in Leviticus 18 and in Leviticus 20. We find a series of sexual offenses being enumerated and all of them in the summary statement at the end of Leviticus 18 are called abominations to a vote. But it's interesting of all those individual offenses preceding the summary, it's only uh, man-male intercourse that's specifically tagged with toava in the singular abomination. So it's a way of underscoring the particular unnatural and abhorrent quality of the act in God's view of things. Moreover, within these prohibitions, there's an implicit rationale in them. A man shall not lie with a male as though lying with a woman. That is, as though treating a male as a sexual counterpart to himself, when in fact it's a sexual same. So implicit in this prohibition is the rationale that you shall not have sex with somebody who's too much of a sexual same and not enough of a sexual other, a complementary other to oneself. We know also that these kinds of prohibitions, these sex laws that we find in Leviticus 18 and 20, are involve offenses that we don't typically regard as merely ritual offenses. We don't regard the prohibition against incest or adultery or bestiality as merely ritual impurity offenses, but we regard them as moral impurity offenses. In fact, the whole nomenclature that's used here of impurity, of uncleanness, is typically used for moral sexual offenses. It can be used for ritual offenses also, but when applied to sexual offenses, it typically is applied to sexual offenses as moral offenses. Moreover, the, we, the typical elements that characterize ritual offenses don't prevail here. Uh, it, with regard to adultery or incest or same-sex intercourse or bestiality. These offenses are not contagious. You can't catch these offenses by touching. On the other hand, with some other impurity offenses, like, for example, coming into contact with corpse impurity or a discharge impurity of some sort, it's contagious. If you come into contact with it, you catch it. Moreover, ritual impurity offenses take in both advertent and inadvertent actions. That is, both actions that are deliberately undertaken and actions that accidentally occur. If you happen to walk by a corpse, it does not matter what your personal intent was. You are rendered ritually unclean by that contact. In the case of moral impurity offenses, however, 
uh, those take in only uh, deliberate offenses, not accidental occurrences. We know that this is the case with regard to the sexual offenses in Leviticus 18 and 20, because in Leviticus 20, it, the notation is added that, uh, that the persons who engage in such behavior are culpable for the offense, their blood be upon them. And that's a culpability formula. So it indicates that these persons are engaging in the offense consensually, deliberate fashion, they know what they're doing, and therefore, and only because of that, can they be held culpable. Moreover, we know that the uh, offenses cannot be rectified, the sexual offenses in Leviticus 18 and 20, merely by ritual bathing and the going down of the sun in the evening or some longer period of time. They are regarded as extreme offenses, capital offenses, in effect. We also know that the sexual offenses that are mentioned in Leviticus 18 and 20 are picked up in the New Testament that are still relevant for today not the offense with regard to sex with a menstruant woman. We don't find that picked up in the New Testament, but we do find the offenses of adultery, bestiality, incest, and same-sex intercourse picked up, indicating their ongoing relevance. We also know that it's not simply a symbolic offense. Uh, for example, offenses like not sowing two kinds of seed in the same field, or not creating a cloth composed of two different types of fabric. We know that these are merely symbolic matters because actually in ancient Israel, the, the, you can find cloth mixtures in the tabernacle, in some parts of the priestly wardrobe, and in the tassel that's worn by the laity. Uh, and that's a way of demonstrating that there are certain spheres of existence which are regarded as especially holy. The people of God are regarded as especially holy to God and they have that mixed fabric tassel as a reminder where there's an intersection of the divine realm into the earthly realm, hence symbolized by the cloth mixture. But we know that the offense involving incest or bestiality or adultery like that of same-sex intercourse is not merely symbolic in character. They really do intend to indict the literal acts involving each of these offenses. Jesus doesn't explicitly cite a prohibition of man-male intercourse because in his cultural context, it would have been a complete waste of time to do so. We also know that Jesus makes absolutely no mention of the problem of incest, particularly man-mother incest or parent-child incest. We have no doubt, however, that Jesus accepted the strongly held prohibitions in the Old Testament on that matter. There is no Jew that's advocating a violation of this stance, let alone engaging in it. So for Jesus to have stopped and commented on incest or same-sex intercourse or bestiality would have been regarded as odd by any Palestinian or had he ever ventured uh, into the Mediterranean basin uh, by any diaspora Jew. It would have been regarded as very unusual because nobody is advocating it, nobody's participating in the behavior. It's a complete waste of time to talk about it at all. But we do find Jesus actually dealing with the presuppositions here. Because when Jesus talks about the issue of divorce and remarriage in Mark 10 with the parallel in Matthew 19, he makes clear what is foundational for human sexual ethics. He cites two key texts. One third of Genesis 1:27, male and female he made them, and Genesis 2:24. Therefore, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and become joined to his woman or wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The only thing in common between those two sets of texts is a male-female requirement for all matters of sexual ethics. That is, a male-female or a man and a woman. And Jesus' joining of these two texts together indicates what the therefore is therefore in Genesis 2.24. Uh, why is it that a man may become joined to a woman and the two become one flesh? because God created us precisely as complementary sexes, male and female, anatomically, physiologically, psychologically, designed for sexual pairing, moderating the extremes of a given sex and filling in the gaps of the sexual self. It's precisely on the basis of that male-female requirement that Jesus develops a view about limiting the number of partners in a sexual union to two, 
whether at any one time, no polygamy, or whether in a revolving door of divorce and remarriage, rejecting that, divorce for any cause. Because what Jesus is doing is saying, look at the number of persons that God created for sexual union, male and female, two sexes, not three sexes, not four sexes, two. And when you bring those two sexes together in a sexual union, they close and affect the sexual spectrum. They create an integrated sexual whole. The two halves of the sexual spectrum unite into a single flesh, one whole flesh. And it's on that basis that Jesus can indicate that a third party in a sexual union or more is neither necessary nor desirable because you've already closed the sexual spectrum by uniting the two that God has created for complementary pairing, male and female. What that means is that although Jesus didn't explicitly address the issue of homosexual practice, he did address the foundation for sexual ethics, which is a male-female requirement. And if we regard monogamy as important, the limitation of two persons to a sexual union at any one time, we have to remember that Jesus extrapolated that principle from a foundation. The foundation is the male-female requirement. Homosexual practice is obviously a direct violation of that because it posits the view that there is no male-female prerequisite to a sexual bond. Those things don't matter. But for Jesus, they mattered enough that he made it foundational. That's certainly buttressed by the fact that we look in Matthew 5 and we look at the six antitheses of the Sermon on the Mount. You used to hear the following, but now I say you can no longer get away with that. I'm closing that loophole. Two of those six antitheses that Jesus addresses in Matthew 5 uh, happen to do with sex. Adultery of the heart statement, which uh, moves God's command into the interior of the human heart, not just what we do externally, thereby intensifying God's ethical demand, and also the another divorce remarriage saying. And in the midst of those two occurs this saying, that if your hand, eye, or foot should threaten your downfall, cut it off. It's better to go into heaven maimed than to go into hell full-bodied. And that's Jesus' way of underscoring that sexual purity really does matter because sexual offenses can get you thrown into hell. We also know that, that Jesus, with regard to the divorce remarriage statement, instead of maximizing the opportunity that people had for sexual freedom and sexual expression, actually closed the remaining loopholes. Ancient Israel was fairly rigorous in its observance of sexual ethic standards. Jesus just looked at the two elements over which there was some laxness, namely the permission given to men to have more than one wife or to divorce their wives for any cause, closes that loophole, and then the uh, silence about the uh, interior of the human heart, he addresses with the adultery of the heart statement. So that it's not just enough to be pure in one's outward behavioral practice, but also within one's mind. God wants to regulate that, those thoughts as well. So rather than Jesus softening God's ethical demand in sexual ethics, he actually intensifies it. If we take a parallel example, we can look at Jesus' outreach to tax collectors. Tax collectors were notorious in the first century for being materially exploitative of fellow Jews. They were complicitous with an oppressive foreign power, the Romans, to collect taxes and had a justly deserved reputation of collecting several times over what they were supposed to collect and pocketing the excess for their own advantage. Uh, These people, liberation theologians, would have a field day with them today as persons who are despicable in every way, depriving persons who live on the economic margins of life of basic necessities for survival. And yet Jesus reached out to them aggressively in love spending much of his ministry among them, proclaiming the kingdom of God to them, uh, even eating with them in their homes, in order to emphasize to them the importance of repentance. The reason why Jesus reached out to them was not to say, it doesn't matter whether you exploit your fellow Jews. On the contrary, the message that he was giving them is unless you repent, you will not inherit the very kingdom of God that I am proclaiming. So the outreach to tax collectors does not demonstrate that Jesus didn't care about economic exploitation. On the contrary, we have a tremendous number of sayings within the gospel that indicate Jesus' concern over such matters. By the same token, when Jesus reaches out to sexual sinners, 
another point for which he's well known. Uh, the sinful woman in Luke 7, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4 and other texts. And yet, uh, Jesus' outreach to them is just like his outreach to the tax collectors. He's not communicating by that outreach that their sin does not matter. On the contrary, it matters so much that they're at high risk of being excluded from the kingdom he proclaims. That's why he spends time with them. So when we look at the story, the well-known story of the woman that's caught in adultery in John 8, we find this point being underscored. Yes, Jesus does tell people not to stone her and let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. We have to know then in texts like these what is meant literally and what's meant figuratively. This is not meant as a figurative stoning. Jesus himself has a negative evaluation about adultery. This is literal stoning. If they stone her, they close off any opportunity for her to actually repent. Dead people quite simply don't repent. And what Jesus was communicating both to the crowd and to the woman is that there is something more serious than a capital sentencing in this life. And that's being excluded from the kingdom of God forever. And Jesus wanted to create every last possible opportunity for that adulterous woman to repent. When Jesus tells the woman at the end of that story, from now on, no longer be sinning, we actually know what the follow-up of that line is because we have a similar line in John 5 where Jesus says, uh, now on no longer be sinning, lest something worse happen to you. And in that context in John 5, that something worse is not inheriting eternal life. Now in effect, what Jesus is saying to the woman caught in adultery, there's something worse than a capital sentence here, and that's being excluded from the kingdom forever. Now this has relevance to the issue of homosexual practice, because as we know in Leviticus 20, uh, a man having sex with another male is a capital offense. It's a death sentence. So some people will argue, well, then these commands are no longer relevant. But that's not the example we get from Jesus. Adultery is also a capital offense in the Old Testament. But what Jesus says is not that adultery doesn't matter, but it matters more than you think. Because not only will it affect your standing in this life, but also in the next. And so that's why Jesus suspends the capital sentencing in order to grant every last opportunity for those engaging in sexual immorality to repent. Otherwise, they would be excluded from the kingdom forever. That's what love means in Jesus' eyes. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, closing the offender list, that such were some of you, but you were justified, you were sanctified in the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. What he's saying is not that the moment the believers at Corinth became believers, they lost all desires, all innate urges to do what God expressly forbids. That's not what Paul is saying. But what he is saying is that their lives have been transformed because they've been brought under the controlling influence of the Spirit of Jesus Christ that indwells them. Although they may still experience the innate desires to do what God doesn't want them to do, they don't carry out those desires, they don't continue to function as slaves to those desires because they now have a power within them that's stronger than that impulse to do what God has prohibited. And so therefore, such were some of you. Your lives are no longer characterized by enslavement to these sinful desires not because these sinful desires don't exist in you, but because as persons who have been brought under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we live lives now of holiness rather than lives of enslavement to sin. That doesn't mean that we're perfect or that we never sin and don't need to ask God forgiveness. It means that in the main in our life, we recognize that Jesus and not sin operating in us is Lord.